it's wonderful to be here. I think to see this room full of people and to be here in Bedford Square is a great treat, and particularly to be with these two fantastic authors. And what we're going to do, therefore, is plunge almost straight into them, each telling you something about the book they've written and reading a small extract. We're going to have some conversation, but this is very much over to you. For those of you who don't know, Pigeon English uh, follows five months in the life of a little boy called Harry, Harry Apoku. He's 11 years old. He's just arrived in uh, an inner city estate in London from Ghana. And there are gangs that patrol this estate to provide uh, some promise of protection for him, some promise of uh, camaraderie for him that maybe he feels he's lacking. Uh, so he's tempted to join them. And uh, the scene I'm going to read to you now is uh, an initiation that uh, uh, Harry finds himself uh, unwittingly involved in. Here we go, this one will do. Mr. Frimpong was walking towards us. He was only past the supermarket. There was nobody else around him. That's when I knew he was the target. I felt sick all over again. He only had one bag of shopping. I could see the bread sticking out. He's only skinny. Mr. Frimpong is the oldest person from church. That's when I knew why he sings louder than anybody else. It's because he's been waiting the longest for God to answer. He thinks God has forgotten him. I only knew it then. Then I loved him, but it was too late to go back. I hope I don't knock him over. Crossfire, let's do this shit, go. We ran. Dizzy and Killer ran together. I followed them. I put my coat over my head. I was only playing suicide bomber. I didn't care if I didn't hit anybody. I don't need the points. I just kept running. I didn't even want to see where I was going. I couldn't stop. I just ran as fast as I could. My heart was going proper fast. I could feel the taste of metal, the wind rushing past. I just ran. In Darkness is the story of Shorty, who is a 15-year-old uh, kind of reluctant gangster from the slums of Cité Soleil in Haiti and Port-au-Prince. Um, he's been dragged into this kind of internecine conflict between two gangs in the Cité. And um, he, at the start of the story, is in hospital in Port-au-Prince and he's been shot in the arm. We don't know why he's been shot in the arm, but there's kind of a mystery uh, to be solved as the book goes on as to how he came to be in that situation. And he's in that situation when the earthquake comes along in January 2010 and the hospital falls down around him. And he finds himself trapped in the rubble, in the darkness, uh, hence the cunning title of the book. Um, <laughs> And I kind of rapidly realised that actually it's very difficult to tell a story when your character's trapped in the darkness and <laughs> can't move and can't touch anything. And so really the book becomes him looking back on his life and his upbringing and how he's come to this position and how he became a gangster. Just then there was a bang and another and we ducked when we realised that someone was shooting. I turned down an alley after Biggie and saw the Boston kid pressed against the wall at the end. He was half bent over, panting. Biggie was looking down at him, his favourite gun, his Tech 9 in his hand. You want to say anything before I kill you, he said. The kid, he really was just a kid, straightened up. I could have killed that guy, he said. The one who was with you on the truck. I'm a good shot. I could have killed him, but I didn't. I just shot him in the leg. Yeah, said Biggie. I don't give a shit. You ambushed us, you die. The kid nodded. Do me a favour, he said. My name's Frank. Tell my mum I love her. Tell her I'm sorry for letting her down. Okay, Nick and Stephen, we're in very tough territory here, um, but we've got two absolutely delightful heroes, in a sense, in very challenging times. Um, we're always being told how, you know, children behave badly, you know, the terrible modern child and all of the rest. You've given us two kind of delightful characters who are actually the victims of their circumstances, essentially. Was that what you were intending to do? Are you exploring how childhood really is because children's lives can be so shitty, basically? Absolutely. I think uh, in these environments, they're two very different environments, but they, yeah. they are subject to similar pressures and similar forces. Uh, and these are environments that kind of corrode innocence. Mm. And then for me, it's interesting to see how innocence can survive and maybe even thrive despite that. But I, I think, uh, yeah, kids, they, they need outlets, don't they? Mm. Uh, if a kid is inherently good, then they will always find something positive to, to cling on to despite what's going on around them. Um, and Harry is a, a younger, na younger age than Shorty, so he's, he's less further along the road of his own 
his own slip into immorality. So he mm -hmm. still has that innocence to, to clutch onto. Whereas I know Nick in your book, Shorty is a uh, He's a very more compromised much. character. <laughs> <Very> much, <yeah. laughs> I mean, we've just seen him shoot someone. He's, um, he's... But he's been locked in conflict for longer. He has, and he's, um, I think he's inherently a good person, but yes, he's been drawn into this conflict, and it has to do with his father's murder, which he believes was carried out by Boston, which is the rival gang. I guess what I was interested in was um, something that I will term the globalisation of gangsterism, which mm. is... I think, you know, gangsterism is nothing new and knife crime is nothing new and certainly there were different groups in Victorian London or in Victorian Manchester who were stabbing each other and having street battles but generally those things were, were divides that were happening along some kind of ethnic lines or some kind of, some kind of division which actually exists in the world whereas what I got fascinated by with Haiti and particularly by El Salvador which was the place I first read about is that you get these gangs who are basically exported from LA uh, from kids having come over to LA with their parents and then being deported back. And so I was kind of interested in the way that what I think is quite a dangerous kind of cultural idea, like gangster rap, gets exported to somewhere which already has massive problems and causes this just entirely random and arbitrary kind of binary opposition to grow up because they're all Haitians, they all come from the same place, and yet because of that gang loyalty, they're killing each other. And I kind of, I was fascinated by what that does if you are a person who is kind of inherently trying to do the right thing but you're caught up in this thing which which is never going to end because as long as there's bloodshed there'll be revenge and hatred and yeah so it was sort of yeah the notion of the individual in the system I suppose. This uh, gang culture has become so insidious it, it is a global thing and it's uh, it doesn't pay any respects to territory or national boundaries or ethnic boundaries it just seems to be something that is generational that a whole generation of kids throughout the world have, have now got this uh, insidious and quite poisonous ideal to cling on to this ideal that uh, uh, to gain respect or to gain some kind of escape route from the difficult situations you find yourselves in uh, the best way to do that is through violence or mm -hmm. through at least the the pretense of violence. But in both of them, in both your characters and, and the settings you give them, you're very unjudgmental, strangely. I mean, you know, you, you are not, neither neither your neither of your characters are judging people at all. And one of the advantages, I would think, about using a child's voice is that you don't have to take that kind of adult perspective on behaviour. Is no. that right? And, and, so, and would you both like to say something about writing in the voice of a, a child? Well, I suppose ultimately I don't judge that behaviour because I don't think that on a kind of fundamental sociological level, belonging to a gang is any different from belonging to a book club. Or, you know, that sounds like an extreme thing to say, but, but it's, it's a very similar mechanism which is operating, which is one of belonging mm. and of camaraderie. As they fulfil the same needs, exactly, don't they? They fulfil that need for fraternity. But yeah, I think rising from a child's perspective allows you to bring out that innocence. And that, because I think it's perfectly possible to be innocent and to do terrible things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, these characters are morally compromised, and it's then how they respond to that that is interesting. But uh, they're both at ages where uh, adulthood I is certainly infringing on, on their, their natural innocence, uh, and it is, it's taken them for a ride down a very dangerous path, a path of many temptations and many challenges. Uh, and to, to write about that, that point in a, in a young man's life where he's almost forced either through his surroundings or his experiences to ask himself what kind of man he's going to become, what kind of adult he's going to turn into, and they're forced to make those moral choices. And I think that's really interesting about both books, that we have characters there who, uh, whose moral journey is laid out before the reader. Mm. Um, and I think share that with them. where the moral failing does not lie in them, but in their surroundings. It's not them yes. who are failing to provide you know, the security that that slums need, or that, or that even, even your character needs in that inner city London environment. You know, mm. they're, they're, they're not the ones who are letting themselves down. No, no, the, these are problems that are created by adults, uh, and unfortunately the, the kids are, are subject to those problems, mm. and they can't solve them, they can't really bring to bear any kind of control on those things. All they can do is uh, uh, try their best to, to respond to that. In, in a way that still allows them to retain whatever uh, 
sense of goodness they might have. Mm. 